Turn with me in your Bibles, if you brought them with you, to Luke chapter 1. That's where we'll be today, Luke chapter 1. As you're turning there, I want to share with you a story that I read recently about a five-year-old boy who, who became uh, deathly ill, so much so that he actually lost his vision uh, by the age of seven. And uh, but he was undaunted. He, he ended up uh, learning how to function. He learned Braille. He, he ended up uh, beginning to learn to play the piano as a young man uh, uh, with no vision. By the time he was 15, <clears throat> though, he became orphaned. Uh, mom and dad uh, were no longer part of his life. And so just kind of picture that, 15 years old, orphaned, uh, blind, uh, but still, still undaunted, still refused to give up, and he kept working on his music and developing uh, his talent. At age 17, he moved to Seattle where he began performing, and in 1952, at the age of 22, he signed a recording contract with Atlantic Records and began performing uh, his uh, world-famous voice in front of millions of people. Uh, it's said that his creative genius, his joy in performing the music resonated through his voice, and, and the music seemed to flow freely out of him. Uh, it seemed to... Seemed to to come from deep within, deep within his own spirit. And he was being interviewed on television, and uh, the, the interviewer asked, said, uh, not long ago, I watched you perform two different concerts on successive nights. And the interviewer said, uh, in both concerts, you sang your hit song, Georgia. Then he said this, he said, but you sang it differently each time. So the entertainer replied, he said, that, that's right. Every time I do it differently. Because you see, I don't learn music by notes. I let it bubble up out of my soul. And when I read this story and, and I heard this, this statement from Ray Charles, how many of you, you, you all have heard of Ray Charles, right? Yeah. Uh, he, doesn't, he sings a little different than, than the average bear. Uh, it seems to, his whole, everything about him seemed to be in the music. And, but when he made this statement, it, it got me thinking, it reminded me about joy, true joy. And I got a statement here for you. If Christ is living in you, then the joy of the Lord will bubble up out of your soul and affect everyone around you, just like his music bubbled up out of his soul and affected everybody around him. I tell the worship team uh, periodically, I say, you know, if Jesus is in your heart, what, what your face is going to know about it, right? And we're going to explore, explore joy today and, and, and kind of talk about it as we walk through Advent season. Uh, but I want you to, if, if you get one thing today, I want you to get this. The joy of the Lord that's given to you is not just for you. And that's important to understand. A lot of times we think, what, you know, Christmas season, uh, what is God going to do in my life? What's he doing with me, in me? And that's all good. But the joy that he gives you is not just for you. The joy that he gives you is to be shared and to be uh, uh, um, demonstrated for, uh, to affect other people around you. And we're going to kind of look at that uh, today as we look at how to, how to experience true, authentic joy, regardless of the circumstances, regardless of the situation that you find yourself in. There's a lot of joy in the Christmas season. And, and, and this, this event that we celebrate, this, this birth of a child, normally would bring great joy. But imagine the, the birth of the Messiah, the joy that that was going to bring to the entire world. And it's important to understand, though, that true joy is not separate from pain and suffering and disappointment. True joy is not uh, 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 di divorced from that, okay? Uh, many times, true joy is born out of that. In the midst of the sorrow, in the midst of the, the troubles and the trials and the, and the disappointments, that's when the true joy of God begins to take root in our lives. And we're going to talk about that because it sounds, like, sounds almost like a, an oxymoron. How can I have joy in the midst of sorrow? How can I have joy in the midst of disappointment? How can I have joy uh, in a world that is dark and, and, and just 
full of trials and difficulties. I want to introduce you to Elizabeth and Mary. And Luke's story begins, uh, Luke's event of Christmas, the Christmas story begins a little bit before Mary and Joseph with the prophet Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth. Take a look at what we read here in, in uh, Luke chapter 1, beginning of verse 5. It says, In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. We have a situation here. Uh, it, was a, it was a dark day in, in uh, Israel's history at this time. We talked a little bit about that last week, if you remember. But uh, God, Israel, God's people, had not received a prophetic word from God at this point for 400 years. The last time they had a prophetic word from the Lord was Malachi 400 years earlier. And he was talking about the coming of the one that was the voice that cried in the wilderness. So he was coming, uh, crying, talking about the, the, uh, the one that was going to come and prepare the way for the Lord. And then 400 years go by. So imagine making a promise. Imagine saying, this is what's going to happen. And day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, century after century, nothing happens. That's the situation that they're in. Add to that the fact that the spiritual leaders of the day were, were, uh, they were, they were shackled by tradition. And in many cases, corruption. King, their king, Herod, he was uh, not a nice guy. Uh, in fact, this particular king, Herod, uh, had nine wives. And uh, supposedly he had one of them executed for no reason at all. Just something needed to take place that day. So he executed one of his wives. Not a good guy. And, and, and yet in the middle of all of this darkness, in the middle of all this, and well, and we talk, as we talked last week, uh, the people were under Roman suppression at the time. They were basically slaves to the Roman Empire. It was a dark time. And in the midst of this, though, we see two bright lights. Zechariah. Uh, Zechariah means uh, Jehovah has remembered. Okay? And Elizabeth is here too. And Elizabeth means God is my oath. They were a godly couple. They were older, uh, but they were a godly couple. They were both of the, uh, the priestly order. Uh, and uh, in that day, according to uh, 1 Chronicles 24, there were 24 kind of sets of priests that would come in and serve in temple. And they would each serve for two weeks out of the year. And then the, the next group would come in and so on and so forth. And this happened to be Zechariah's time. He would come in, he would light the candles, and he would, he would tend to the temple, okay? And it was a great, great honor. And, and, and he, here he is, he's doing this. And despite, all, so we also keep in mind, Elizabeth is also of the priest's daughter. She comes from the, the daughters of Aaron, okay? So she's got a priestly line. Uh, Zechariah has a priestly line, and they're both following the Lord. Okay. Their greatest sorrow, though, was they had they had no children. A little did they know, though, God was going to change all that. Uh, and you know the you know the story. Uh, the angel Gabriel shows up, and so here's Zechariah. He's in the temple. He's tending. He's doing what he's supposed to be doing. The honor of tending in the temple, and and an angel appears. Not just any angel, but the announcing angel himself, Gabriel. There's only a few named angels in the Bible. He's one of them. And he comes and he uh, lets, him, lets Zechariah know, you're, you're going to, I know you're old. And I know your wife has been barren for all these years. And I know you've given up hope, but you're going to have a son. And not just any son, you're going to have a powerful prophetic son who's going to be the fulfillment of a promise and prepare the way for the Messiah, the Savior. <laughs> and Zechariah is so overwhelmed, he could barely even believe this news. He's, he's, and he questions Gabriel. I'm looking forward to meeting Gabriel someday because uh, Gabriel basically is, says, okay, you have trouble with this. I'm going to give you a sign. You can't speak. You're not going to be able to speak until your son is born. 
As some people say that it was a, a punishment or, or, or discipline. Some people say it was a sign. Whatever it was, it definitely was supernatural in nature. Okay? And so, so here's Zechariah. He comes out of the temple. He can't speak all of a sudden. He has to write everything down. He has to tell everybody, like, oh, something really amazing must have happened in there. Tell us what happened. He can't speak. So he has to write it all down. He has to sign. He makes signs to them to try to get them to understand what's going on. And, 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 and Elizabeth is part of this. And Elizabeth seemed to believe a little sooner. She didn't have as much trouble. And, and, and I was thinking about that, and I was thinking, well, yeah, she, she was pregnant. <laughs> she, you know, I, I know, and I've heard guys and ladies work with her here, right? Uh, we've heard husbands say, man, that pregnancy was, was a tough one. Guys, we can't say that ever, okay? The ladies, they can say it all they want. We can't be like, I, and I remember saying it one time, like, wow, this was a, I was talking to Angela, I was like, this, is a, this has been a tough pregnancy. She looked at me, she's like, you think so, tough guy? I'm like, well, so... Elizabeth got it sooner. She's the one that's pregnant. She got it sooner. And look at what she says here in verse 25. Thus hath the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked upon me. Look at this. Look at these words. To take away my reproach among men. <laughs> Elizabeth mentions her, her reproach, her disgrace. You think, whoa, I thought you said she was a godly woman. She was a godly woman. A very godly woman. So much so that scripture even, even tells us that she was. But in that culture, in that day, if you could not, if you were a woman and you could not have a child, people assumed it was because you were living in sin or you were not looked favorably upon by the Lord. That was the situation. That, was a, that wasn't the biblical mandate back then. That was the culture. Okay? And no doubt that uh, over the years, uh, her self-worth just sunk, just kept going down and down, and got to the point where she's, you know, she said, she loses all hope. And at some point, she and everyone around her would have labeled her and would have, would have you know, she's, she's barren. She would have had to have this stigma the rest of her life. Now, if this were a movie, there would be a subtitle that said, would say, Meanwhile in Galilee. Okay, because this is the only thing that's happening in the world. The, the angel comes, says, you're going to have a child. Okay, six months later, we find out Mary, who, has, who, who is not even married yet, who has never been with a man, all of a sudden, Mary is with child as well. And, and, and she receives this, this news, and, and, and Gabriel delivers the most miraculous, most sought-after, most promised uh, child announcement ever. We have, child, we have uh, baby reveals, gender reveals now, where they do all kinds of elaborate things. They shoot balloons in the air, and they pop it, and it's blue, or it's pink, or we get all kinds of different ways of doing that now. This was the first one. Okay, this was the first... The, 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 the biggest one in all of history. Gabriel comes down and says, Mary, you're going to have a child. And she receives that. She receives that, that announcement with uh, um, grace and willingness. But she was, she was very young. You've got to keep in mind the culture of the day and what's going on. She's young. She's a godly girl. And all of a sudden, she's with child, not married. And her life was about to become challenging at the very least. She hears about Elizabeth. And it, and it seems to, you know, we think, why would she just leave and go to Elizabeth? Elizabeth is her older cousin. She hears about this miraculous situation that, that uh, Elizabeth is in. It's not hard to assume Oh, that makes sense. She's going to go to the one person on the planet who's probably going to be able to understand, who's probably going to be able to relate to her. And, and, and this, is where, this is where joy begins to erupt in this story, in this event. Take a look at verse 41. It says, when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, so Mary travels, goes to see her cousin. When, when Mary comes, now Elizabeth is six months pregnant, so she's got something going on here, okay? She, she's... she's She's got a belly, and she's got a baby growing, and she's excited. And here comes Mary, her younger cousin. 
And, and Elizabeth, when Elizabeth heard the, the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is it granted to me that the mother of my Lord, she already understands what's going on here. The mother of my Lord should come to me. For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Wow. What? I think about this situation about what's going on here. She has no idea that Mary is pregnant. Mary shows up, and all of a sudden, the baby, who is six months old inside of uh, Elizabeth. Elizabeth, you know, Bible teaches that uh, a baby becomes a baby at the moment of conception. So that we, we, here, here's six months into this. So technically, John's only six months old. He's in the womb. He's three months before he's going to come out. But at six months, he's able to recognize God showing up. And he just erupts in the womb with joy. And, and Elizabeth is just kind of out of her mind here. And think about the relief this would have been to Mary. Mary doesn't have to explain herself. She doesn't have to... Uh, uh, um, you know, set the stage to, to kind of soften what's about to be said. She just shows up. And the joy of the Lord erupts in John and it erupts in Elizabeth and spreads to Mary. Joy came bursting out of her and, and she's saying, so Mary responds with what we call Mary's song. I'm going to read the first few verses for you. Uh, it says, Mary said, so this is, again, it's called, this is considered Mary's song. She says, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Yes, Mary needed a Savior too. For he has looked upon the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and his and holy is his name. This is a beautiful and powerful passage in Scripture. Mary is experiencing something. Yeah, she's, she, you know, we think, oh, Mary, you are so honored and blessed. You're going to bring the Messiah into the world. Yes. But Mary was also facing a very, very challenging life. She was going to be facing a very, very difficult time here. And in the midst of this joy, takes root. In the midst of all this trouble and the struggle and the potential of, of, of having a really difficult time, joy erupts all around her. And, and I want to take just a few moments to, to kind of see what that joy means to us and what we can do about it. So you can follow along in your notes. We're going to be brief today because this is, uh, God has made it so very powerful and so very obvious. So first and foremost is joy. Uh, first, First of all, we understand it's okay to be joyful. It's okay to be joyful. Now, for some of you, this is a no-brainer. But for others, not so much. For some people, we've experienced such sorrow and loss that we may feel, we may even feel a little guilty about being joyful. I remember... The first Christmas that came along that, uh, you know, after my dad passed away, I remember, you know, getting excited about Christmas, getting excited about what was going on. And, and I remember thinking, you know, my dad wasn't going to be here. And I started, I started feeling guilty. I started feeling even a little ashamed that I was experiencing joy and happiness. And I thought, well, yeah, but my dad just passed away not too long ago. And I started getting a little down about that, a little guilty about experiencing joy. And I think that sometimes we might feel like we're betraying the person that's no longer there, or some sorrow, some difficulty in our life. You know, we experience somebody's sick or somebody's struggling, and, we, and you know, we experience joy, and we think, well, yeah, but all the suffering that's going on in the world, should I even be feeling this joy? It's almost as if we need permission to experience joy again. And, and if that is you today, 
I, I, I want you to hear this. Uh, permission granted. Not from me. I have no authority to grant you permission to experience joy, but I know someone who does. And, and it's the same one who filled Mary and Elizabeth and the yet-to-be-born John with joy. Look at what he says in John 15, 11. Jesus says this. Jesus says, uh, these things have I spoken unto you. Uh, when, you when we read through Scripture, sometimes it's easy to just kind of read through. But look what he says here. That my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Jesus gives us the permission to experience his joy. Joy is not based on stuff that happens around us. Joy is not based on our circumstances or our situations. So joy shouldn't be taken away by that either. Jesus says, my joy, which is completely separate from what you're experiencing in the world, my joy, I'm giving you my joy, and I'm giving you permission to enjoy my joy. It doesn't mean that you're betraying somebody. It doesn't mean that you're, you're a callous. It doesn't mean that you're unfeeling. It doesn't mean that you're self-centered or, or selfish. He says, I'm giving you my joy to experience. I'm giving you permission. In fact, it goes so far as to, uh, that he actually prays to the Father for this. In, in the, the, the actual Lord's Prayer, uh, John 17, 13, Jesus says, I am coming to you. He's talking to his father. He's talking to God the Father. I am coming to you. And these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in them. I want you to imagine this just for a second. I want you to imagine, imagine Jesus, God the Son, in a time of communication with God the Father. And what does he say? Lord, fill them with my joy. Now, he's about to go to the cross at this point in John 17. His disciples, his followers are about to experience the darkest time in all of history. If we took all of our darkness, all of our struggles, all of our pain, all of our disappointments from everybody that's here today and put it together, it would pale in comparison to what the, what the apostles are, are about to experience. They're going to lose. They're, they're going to witness Jesus die on the cross. And what does he say? He says, let them be filled with my joy. Prepare them. Give them my joy. What is this joy? As I was reading through this, I just get overwhelmed by the thought that God himself is praying that I experience his joy. If anybody's prayers are going to be answered, it's going to be the one that answers them, right? Does that make sense? And, and, and I think, well, so I started thinking, well, what is this joy that he speaks of? This is kind of what, as I was looking through Scripture, this is uh, kind of the definition of joy that I, that I was able to extrapolate from Scripture. Uh, joy is tuning into what God's doing around you, seeing the, word through, seeing the world through his eyes, sensing his delight in us as his children. Joy goes deeper than our pain, far deeper. Joy is when your whole being sings, being sings because you have caught a glimpse of God at work in, around, and through you. That's joy. It's got everything to do with him and nothing to do with our failures, with our uh, 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 troubles, with our trials, with our, our, our disappointments, with our pain, uh, with the betrayals in our own life. With, with, it's got nothing to joy. The joy of the Lord's got to do everything with him. And he gives it to us. Some of us need to hear this this time of year. Some of us need to hear, it's okay to enjoy joy. It's okay to experience joy and to embrace joy. So if you're here today, if you're watching online and you're, you're having this trouble, it's, it's, you, you, you know, you're, maybe you're in the midst of sorrow, maybe Christmas brings memories of pain and, and suffering and a loss. If that is you, God says, it's okay. It's okay to experience joy. Because, uh, we go to our second point here, because joy is our strength. Joy is our strength. And Mary was certainly going to need to draw on some strength here, okay, in, in the months, in the years to come. Uh, Mary, 
uh, she would have known about the challenge that were about to take place. The scorn and the shame uh, that she was going to experience and that her family was going to experience and that her fiance was going to experience. In fact, uh, um, you know, you kind of think, how is she going to be able to explain to, ch to people that the baby in her womb was from God? How's this young, she was probably a, a teenager, mid-teenage, mid-teenage years, late teenage at the oldest. How is she going to explain to the world, no, wait a minute, don't judge me yet. The baby that's in my belly is from God. It's, it's, I, 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 I'm still a good girl. I'm still, I'm still following the Lord. I didn't do anything wrong. This, this, is a, this is the blessing from the God that's been promised since the beginning of time, practically. How is she going to explain this to the world that's not going to really want to hear what she has to say? Even Joseph couldn't believe this news at first. Uh, Matthew's account of this uh, event, in Matthew's account, uh, we read that Joseph thought about these things, and Joseph was going to end the, uh, the, the it would be a separation, okay? He was going to end the engagement, which in that day would have been paramount to divorce. It's very different today. You know, you, you get engaged, and then you call the engagement office, and for some people, it's no big deal. You know, there's no legal ramifications. Back then, it was a very different thing. If you were engaged or betrothed, it was, you were married in the eyes of God, in the eyes of the people. You just hadn't come together yet, okay? So he was thinking about doing, he, you know, he's debating about doing this. So, you know, I, it, imagine what that conversation must have been like. The angel comes to Mary. Mary goes to Joseph and says, I've got something to talk to you about. Not going to be an easy time for her. She was going to need to draw on some strength, strength that was not, uh, of our own. And, and, and we're reminded in Nehemiah 8, 10, it says, uh, go your way, eat the fat, eat the food, uh, and drink the sweet, uh, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto the Lord, neither be ye sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. If you call Sean, I think it's probably still on there, on his voicemail uh, says the joy of the Lord is our strength. Is that still in your stuff? Is that still in your... You changed. Oh, Sean. It was years, though, right? You had it on there for years. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Now, this particular time, what Nehemiah is talking about, this is after the rebuilding of the temple, the rebuilding of the walls, uh, all the trials that happened with that of Jerusalem. And Nehemiah says, you can celebrate. He says, you can rejoice. This is a time for happiness because our source of our joy is God. He didn't tell them to celebrate because, hey, we finally finished this building project. All right, Brian, you've been there. You got a big project, you're done. You're like, whew, glad that's over with, right? Maybe Robin even more feels that way, right? Uh, this is not that. This is, this is the joy of the Lord is your strength. He's saying rejoice because the joy of the Lord is your strength. Not because, the pro not because the temple's done, not because the wall is up, but because your source of your joy is God. He is our true source. Uh, fulfillment comes through Christ. Christmas season is a source of joy because the Messiah came to rescue us. Not because of the presents, not because of the, the trees or the decorations or the meals. There's nothing wrong with any of that stuff, but that's not where joy comes from. And I think that's where people struggle. People think, I'm supposed to be happy this time. I'm supposed to be joyful this time of year. I mean, look around you. We're going to have a white Christmas this year, I think. We live in... Pittsburgh, so it could change at any minute. <laughs> um, but, but you know, all the stuff that's going on, and, and we think, you were supposed to be happy this year, but hmm, sometimes that doesn't happen. It's because we try to draw our joy from someplace other than the Lord. And, and, and he is our true source and fulfillment. Peter describes it this way in 1 Peter 8 and 9. It says, um, whom, having not seen, talking about Christ, you love. In whom, though now ye see him not yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. 
and unspeakable and glorious joy finds its source even deeper than our pain and our sorrow to that place where Jesus has taken up residence in our lives. That's where true joy, no matter what we're facing, we can draw strength. Uh, the strength of our joy comes from the Lord. And finally, and this might be the, the most difficult aspect of, of joy, we can, we can choose joy. Now, I know people are going to probably, uh, uh, there's going to be some people that are going to disagree with that. Some people are going to be, no, you don't understand what my life is like. You don't understand what I face. You don't understand the, the struggles. You don't understand the, the anxiety and depression. You don't, you don't understand. And you're right. I don't. I don't understand what you're going through. I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what you're experiencing. But I do know what God has to say. And he supersedes and transcends anything that I, I'm experiencing, anything that I, I don't understand about this. Uh, there's a lot of uses of this word rejoice in Scripture. It's not a word that we use very often today. Maybe we should. It's the verb form of the word joy. Uh, and and it's, it's the action of feeling or expressing joy and delight. It's the action. If you look a little closely at the word rejoice, uh, it begins with the prefix re, re. And if you remember back to your grammar school, grammar classes, you know that uh, re means once more, again, or return to. So when we rejoice, we're returning to joy. We're returning to that place where we're drawing from uh, our joy from the Lord. Uh, to rejoice means to return to joy. It's, it's a choice. It's an action that we can take to return to that place where we remember what Jesus did and we draw from that. Uh, we, whether we're experiencing or feeling happy or feeling joy, I know people want to separate those words. They'll say, well, joy is something that comes from God. Happiness is something that comes from the things around it. And there's, there are some slight nuances, but in Scripture, that's not so well defined. Joy and happiness are really, really close. I know it, it preaches really well. You know, it really preaches well. Hey, joy comes from the Lord. It's from inside. Happiness is the things that are around you. Don't worry about that. That preaches well, but it's not entirely accurate. In Scripture, those words, a lot of times, they come from the same, same root words and same sources. So God's saying, you know, you can choose joy. You can choose to experience and to rejoice. Whether you're, some of us, uh, so how, how many, how many half-glass-full people are in here today? I'm definitely a glass-half-full guy. How many, be honest, how many glass-half-empty people are there? Okay, we got a few of those, okay. How many of you, the glass is broken and there's nothing even in it at all, okay? There's, we're all across, we're all over the place, okay? We're all, the thing about this is, it doesn't matter what your disposition is. It doesn't matter if you're the glass half full, glass half empty, or I don't even have a glass today kind of person. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. We can return back to that place. We can return daily to Jesus, the source of our joy. We can rejoice in the process. We can refuel our tank. A lot of re's here. We can, we can uh, restore our strength, renew our spirit, reconnect with the source of our joy. We can come back to Jesus, our Savior. Psalm 13, Psalm 13, verse 5 says this. I have trusted in thy mercy. So I want you to hear these words about returning, about choosing. I have trusted in thy mercy. My heart, what's that next word? Shall rejoice in thy salvation. This is where we can find authentic joy. The psalmist is saying, I, I know what's going on, but I'm going. I shall return. I shall Rejoice in thy salvation. As we celebrate this Christmas season, we need to remember that Jesus is the source of our joy. And, and we can return back to him. We can reconnect with God in such a, a, a powerful way. Whether you're experiencing a high, high or a low, low. Whether you're on a mountaintop and you're celebrating and you're like, this is great. 
or you're in a valley and you're experiencing one of the darkest times of your life, wherever you are in between there, we can return back to Jesus. He is the source, the constant source of our joy. Now, I'm not talking about, I'm not suggesting that this is some uh, uh, don't worry, be happy, put on a plastic smile, uh, fake it to you, make it kind of joy. Uh, I, I will be the last person to ever tell you that. If I've learned one thing about this book, it is real from cover to cover. And it never says, hey, fake it. Hey, just kind of make believe to get yourself through the season. Uh, it's not saying to ignore your troubles, to ignore your sorrows, to ignore your anxiety or, or your depression or your, the darkness or the, or the difficulties. It's not saying ignore that. It's saying in the midst of that, remember where true joy comes from. In the midst of that, return to Jesus. It's kind of like the person that uh, gets an injury. Uh, I've got a relative in, in my family, and you all probably know somebody like this. Uh, they get an injury, and the first thing they do is run. Right? Remember, kids. Do, some, a lot of times, the kids will do that. They'll do, they'll do that, and they'll, and they'll take off. And you're like, no, you come back here. I'm the one that can fix that. And, and I, I, I got a relative that used to do that. They'd hurt themselves. They'd, they'd, they'd bolt. I'm like, where are you going? There's nobody over there that can help you. Same thing in the sorrow, in the trials, in the darkness, in the pain, in the suffering. Don't run from Jesus. Don't walk away from him. Return to him. Return to the source of our joy. This is where real, authentic, deep joy comes from. I want to close with uh, Psalm 51.12. Because the psalmist was in this situation. And the psalmist uh, uh, gets to a point where, where am I going to, I need, I need to get back to that place. And look what he says. Restore unto me the joy of what? Of your salvation. Restore unto me the, the joy of of your salvation, and uphold my free spirit, or thy free spirit. Uphold me. Now think about that. The psalmist, whatever's going on in his life, says, Lord, I'm going to be honest. I'm not feeling, experiencing the joy of the Lord today. And no doubt, you and I will experience that, not just because this year has been a tough year, Every year is going to be a tough year. You know, don't think 2021 is a magic reset. Uh, Rick and I were talking about that yesterday. I, I got people saying, I cannot wait for 2020 to be over. Like 2021 is a magic reset. And all of a sudden, everything's magically going to become better. I'm, you know me. I'm a positive guy. I, I, I'm an optimistic guy. 2021 isn't going to fix all of our problems. Okay, January 1st, 2021 is not going to be all of a sudden we're going to wake up and be like, oh, the world is so much better today. Wow, that would be really good. Okay, I shared with uh, uh, Rick yesterday that, you know, in Israel's history, they did have resets. You know, every seven years, if you owe debt, it's gone. Wouldn't that be great? You know, hey, 2021, all of your loans, car loans, house mortgages, everything, zero. It's going to zero out. We're going to zero out everything. That'd be great. Any illness that you have, any struggle that you have, physical struggles, gone. 2021, completely gone. Uh, you're, you're out of work. 2021, you're going to wake up. You're going to have a new job. It's going to pay twice what you were earning before. No. That's not, that's not going to happen. And maybe it'll happen for one or two of you. That'd be great. I hope I'm one of the ones or two. I don't know. I, you know, we think about stuff like we think, hey, a magic reset. Nope. But every day we can get back to the joy of our salvation. Every day we can get back to the Lord Jesus and come to him and say, Lord, I'm kind of striking out today. I'm kind of striking out this week. I'm kind of striking out this year. I feel so far from you. But every day we could take one step back to the Lord. We could be 10,000 steps away. You could be living in sin right now. You could be living in, uh, uh, um, uh, um, you, maybe you're not living in sin. Maybe you just had a tough this year. A anything could be going on. One step brings us right back to the joy of the Lord.
but he's not going anywhere. And he says, you, you know, he says, it's not a magic reset. It's a supernatural reset for your spirit, for your soul, for, your, for who you are as a person. He says, come back to me and I will fulfill your joy. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes for a moment. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so very much for this day. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for loving us. We thank you, Lord, for giving us the joy of your salvation. Father, I ask that you would help us to return to that, to rejoice in you. Thank you for giving us permission to be able to experience your joy. Thank you for giving us the strength of your joy. And thank you for giving us the ability to choose joy today. We love you. Oh, Lord, I also ask that you would lay your hand the blessing upon the, uh, the offering today. I, I ask that you would use that for your glory, honor, and praise. We love you. We cherish you. We come to you in Jesus' name. Amen.